Things seemed to be going rather well in Machias until February of 1775. A British warship wrecked at the mouth of Machias Bay. Some of the men from Bucks Harbor helped rescue the crew to safety. It was told that the ship's pilot was to fall for the wreck. They brought him ashore, but he was able to escape. Apparently, the ship's pilot took them along the wrong route. They said that he acted like he knew where they were going, but that he was either confused or lost. He turned their ship, named the Halifax, into Englishman's River Bay instead of waiting to turn into Machias River Bay. That shipwreck made us nervous. Learning that British soldiers were coming to Machias made us realize that they wanted to know if the people of Machias were loyal to the king or if we were joining the Sons of Liberty. Just three months after that shipwreck, in May of 1775, we learned that the conflict in the 13 colonies was growing. Americans were tired of British tyranny. We wanted a say in how our government ruled over us. Word reached Machias that blood was shed on April 19th, 1775 in the battles of Lexington and Concord. Word spread very quickly. It truly was a shot that was heard around the world. The people of Machias leaned heavily towards American patriotism and freedom from King George III. We were starting to feel like going to war was becoming inevitable. The talk of liberty was on the tongues of most men and women in Machias. Whenever two or three people gathered, the topic of the British grip on trade and commerce was often discussed. The people wanted the freedom to decide how, when, where, and with whom they would trade. The lumber industry had grown and there was money to be made if King George would just let them trade fairly. Products such as sugar had been taxed for years and often at outrageous fees in order for the British to recover losses that they had suffered during the French and Indian War. The 13 colonies had no voice in the British government. They began the slogan, taxation without representation is tyranny. It was based on taxpayers having no say in what or how products were taxed or how the tax revenue was spent. You couldn't even buy a deck of playing cards without paying taxes on them. They taxed about everything that was printed on paper. Here in Machias, we were very dependent on barrels of pork and flour from Boston. The British in Boston could tax the goods we needed or stop shipping food to Machias altogether. They might even tell us what price we could sell our lumber or stop us from shipping it out of Machias. One evening in the spring of 1775, word reached Machias that blood had been shed at Lexington and Concord. Men in our own state of Massachusetts had fought in battles against the King's soldiers. Suddenly, Greater Boston did not seem so far away from Machias. 
Many of our own people had relatives around Lexington and Concord. Several men had gathered at the Burnham Tavern to discuss the news of the battles of Lexington and Concord. A messenger who just arrived in Machias on a schooner reported men of all ages and even young boys barely old enough to hold a musket fought the many redcoats and soon the road was strewn with dead British soldiers. Benjamin Foster was at the tavern and he shouted out, God grant it be true at the news that had come. He was very outspoken about his patriotism and disgust for the British rule over the people. Benjamin Foster was a military man who knew from personal experience what it was like to go to war. He was not likely to be quick to go to battle unless he felt it was necessary. The April 1775 battles of Lexington and Concord was when Paul Revere rode 20 miles on horseback from Boston to Concord to warn the Americans about the British soldiers. It's often not talked about, but there were several women who played important roles in our fight for liberty. A few days after Paul Revere's ride, 16-year-old Sybil Luddington rode 40 miles on horseback to warn her father's American troops that the British soldiers were heading their way. Back here in Machias, as the meeting at the tavern drew to a close, Jeremiah O'Brien suggested raising a liberty tree the following morning. Everyone shouted in agreement. A large white pine was selected and all but the very top limbs were removed. Our town voted to raise a liberty tree, a liberty pole as some would call it. It was a sign or a symbol of our support for the people of Lexington and Concord and for our own desire for liberty and freedom. We dug a hole and we planted that tree right where everybody could see it. We felt we were supporting our friends and families in Lexington and Concord and up and down the entire eastern coastline of America. The Liberty Pole was raised high on the hill near the meeting house and was visible from the shore of West River. It was so high that it was even visible from the mouth of Middle River. It could be seen from most of the waterfront in the entire village. That tree was a clear statement that the people of Machias were ready to take a stand and fight for freedom.